neighbors, your friends. We do have people who visit with us um, that it will be at 7.30. That's because some of you have asked if we could back it up a little bit so you could do your holiday uh, meal time with family or visitors and still come to worship on Christmas Eve. That's a candlelight and communion service. As you tell your neighbors and your friends, please remind them that communion is open to all people in the United Methodist Church, so they don't need to be fearful about whether they could receive communion or not. The um, only other announcement I have is to remind us to look at the sign-up sheets in the uh, fellowship hall and give attention to those, um, especially in, for the month of January and February. I appreciate those of you who are faithful in those months and to sign up and volunteer to do a variety of things. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Jerry. It's another thank you very much for all the support and the cards and the meals and the visits. And I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> thank you, but I'm not going to. Honestly, Bill and I really, really appreciate everything that you all have done for us. You were such wonderful friends and caregivers. Thank you, Mark. Sherry, we have a legal document prepared. <laughs> and while normally in church we don't have you sign that, we're going to have you sign that right now. <laughs> L2 is going to react because I want to know. So many of you. I knew you would enjoy the humor. Any other announcements? Thank you, Sherry. We are delighted that you are with us this morning and that your face looks pain free. Um, so we're pleased for you for that. Any other uh, announcements that need to be made? If not, will you stand as we share in the greeting which you find printed in the bulletin? God is our salvation, our strength, and our power. As the sun-dried land rejoices when refreshed by rain, so we rejoice. When we draw refreshment from deep wells of living water, we shall make the deeds of God known among all nations and proclaim to all that God's name is to be glorified and praised. Our hymn of praise is hymn number 191. I think you'll all find it familiar.
seated. The Markerts and their grandson have come forward to light the uh, candles on the Advent wreath this third Sunday of Advent. You have the readings and there is a response for you, so let us uh, light the Advent candle as we prepare for Christmas. Today is the third Sunday in Advent, the time when we prepare once again for the coming of Jesus. We light a candle each week to remind us that Jesus brings light into the dark places of the world. We rejoice and sing out with gladness at the message of God's salvation. We shout with joy as we anticipate God's coming into our lives and into our world. We light the candle of hope to proclaim that God's light is coming into the world. We light the candle of peace to proclaim that God's promises will be fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ. We light the candle of joy to celebrate that God's saving power is coming into the world. And we'll read together. God of joy, we rejoice in you always as we look forward to your breaking into our history to reveal your justice and your love in person. And we continue as we pray the opening prayer you find printed in the bulletin. O oh God, you so loved the world as to give your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grant to us the precious gift of faith, that we may know that the Son of God is come, and may have power to overcome the world, and gain a blessed immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages for this third Sunday of Advent in the bulletin. Uh, in the, on the insert, I would invite you to follow along as together we read and hear uh, God's holy word. The Old Testament lesson comes from Zephaniah. Zephaniah was one of the minor prophets, um, and much of the book of Zephaniah is a book of Zephaniah's uh, word that came from God as condemnation to the um, inhabitants of Jerusalem for their failure in acting appropriately toward God and for worshiping other gods. But um, in spite of all of this, Zephaniah... Um, comes today in the reading that we have and offers a word of hope. And remember, we uh, lit a candle that's the candle of um, joy uh, this Sunday. And you'll notice that all the readings have that theme of joy or rejoicing in them. And so this reading begins with that word rejoice. And now remember, this is in a time of uh, really a time that's very dismal for the life of the Hebrews. So think of that as you hear this reading. Rejoice, daughter Zion. Shout, Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your judgment. He has turned away your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is in your midst, and you will no longer fear evil. On that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, Don't fear Zion. Don't let your hands fall. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior bringing victory. He will create calm with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you those worried about the appointed feast. They have been a burden for her, a reproach. Watch what I am about to do to all your oppressors at that time. I will deliver the lame. I will gather the outcast. 
I will change their shame into praise and fame throughout the earth. At that time, I will bring all of you back. At that time when I gather you. And I will give you fame and praise among all the neighboring peoples when I restore your possessions and you can see them, says the Lord. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson. Our Psalter reading is from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 through 6, very familiar words, and we will read, read it responsibly. God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and won't be afraid. God, the Lord, is my strength and my shield. He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. Sing to the Lord who has done glorious things. Proclaim this throughout all the earth. And our epistle lesson comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul writes this letter. He's imprisoned, we know, and he... Uh, had tried to finish this letter already, if you're familiar with the book of um, Philippians, but there have been some concerns of the community and its members that have intruded into his, as he was writing the letter, he kind of remembered something and he wanted to address that. Uh, and then he comes to this conclusion, and really what we read is, be glad, literally translated from the Greek, means... Rejoice. Thank you, Mary June. If you were listening earlier, you could have guessed that. Rejoice. And so Paul uses this theme of rejoice as his way of concluding his letter and saying uh, goodbye to the church at Philippi. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. And then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. As I said last week, John the Baptist shows up twice every year in the season of Advent, so this is a continuation of the story of John the Baptist. Then John said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, You children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. The crowd ask him, what then should we do? And John answered, whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none, and whoever has food must do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they said to him, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Collect no more than you are authorized to collect. Soldiers asked, What about us? What should we do? And he answered, Don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. The people were filled with expectation and everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, 
but the one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husk is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn. But he will burn the husk with a fire that won't be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming the good news to the people. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 218. Christmas and wrapping packages and getting on the floor to do all that. I know all about that. It is a busy time of year, isn't it? Will you join me in prayer?
Oh God, we know that every moment of our lives is sacred. And yet we struggle because we sometimes find ourselves caught up in the secular. And while we are not condemned because we live in a world and we participate with the things that many people do at this time of year, we ask that you do help us in an awareness that grows and grows and grows. That as we prepare, we are really keeping time, sacred time. Time that you have given to us and time that ultimately will end and lead to eternal time. We ask now that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth would be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I read a kind of folklore story about a teacher and his students. The students were seeking to learn from the teacher as he had started a quest for the holy or the divine. And he said to his students, God first led me by the hand into a land of action where I dwelt for several years. And then he returned me to the land of sorrows. And there I lived until my heart was purged of every inappropriate attachment and that's when I found myself in the land of love whose burning flames consumed whatever was left in me of myself and that brought me to the land of silence where the mysteries of life and death were bared before my wondering eyes. And the students said, well, master, teacher, what was the final quest of, what was the final stage of your quest? Surely that was it. No, the teacher said, one day God said, I will take you to the innermost sanctuary. To the heart of God himself. And I was led into the land of laughter. That's the story of Dante's purgatory, by the way. Some of you recognize it now. Some of us suffered through it. I wasn't required to read it in any English class. My mother required me to read it. But you remember the only exit was passing through a wall of fire. And once the pain was burned away by love, the other side was paradise. Sheer joy. Isn't life full of both sadness and joy? And both can be opportunities for growth. But we know that joy can overcome sadness. I would offer to you as an example Beethoven. You remember that Beethoven suffered great sadness because of his ultimate complete and total death. He was embarrassed, isolated. Can you imagine being a musician, a conductor, a composer, and you've lost your hearing? 
and remember the story, we all know it, he was conducting his final performance, the Ninth Symphony, and his back to the audience, he couldn't even hear. The only thing he could feel were the vibrations. And when they finished, you know that symphony in it is contained a hymn, or we use the tune for one of our great hymns. What's that tune? Ode to Joy. Thank goodness. Some of you know classical music. You didn't have to take music appreciation. I did. Mm, it was not an easy class. <laughs> and at the end of the performance that he had conducted, someone had to come and turn him around to face the audience so that he could see the crowd who was standing and clapping. at this beautiful piece of music that he had composed, which contained Ode to Joy. Today in the church calendar, for many, many years, we have considered this third Sunday. It had, the candle has its own unique color. We have considered it Rejoice Sunday or Joy Sunday. The liturgy is supposed to be filled with joy. The readings are filled with hopefulness and joy, even though the readings in some instances come in the midst of tremendous persecution and sadness. John the Baptist was preaching proclaiming the Messiah. And it led the crowds to ask him, what, what, what must we do? Remember he had a sermon that was repent. And so the crowds were asking him in response to what he said last week about repentance, what should we do? And his answers were answers about sharing that which you have with others or being fair with others or not mistreating others. The answers all had to do with charity. Charity from the haves towards the have-nots. And for most of us during this season, that kind of um, philanthropic thought still applies. There's a story about a salesman who dreamed that he had gone on to the next life. And he found all the salesmen separated into two groups. The failures, which is what I would be, because I'm not a salesperson. The failures were in one place, and the successful salesmen were in another place. And the salesmen in each place were served a very elaborate banquet. Except that each salesman had a very long iron spoon tied to their hand and it was so long that they couldn't dip into the plate in front of them to eat. And the salesmen who were the failures were trying as best they could and they found no way to enjoy the great banquet prepared for them. But the salesmen who were the successes found that they could take the spoon and dip into the plate of the other and feed the other. And thus they were all able to enjoy this elaborate banquet that had been prepared for them. 
So the man who was dreaming found himself going to each group. And so he first went to the group who were the successful salesperson and said, how did you understand this? And they said, well, unless you help your fellow salesperson, you'll never make a sale. I don't know if that's true in sales or not. Some of you know whether a friend shaking his head, he's in sales. I see there's Wes back there, he's in sales. You know whether that's true or not. I don't. And then the man in his dream went to those who were trying to feed themselves and he asked, why are you not helping each other? And that group of salesmen said, help that dirty crook, no way. I want my commission first. I'll starve before I help that crook. The question that the people asked John the Baptist was pretty much the same. What should we do? And John the Baptist said, if you've got two shirts, share one. I don't even want to think about applying that, folks, okay? My wife just had a sermon with me about this because J. Crew had this incredible sale on shirts. <laughs> they did. It was 50% off plus 15% off plus my wife had a 20% coupon off. So how could I refuse? And I bought some new shirts and she said, you're not bringing more shirts into this house until you get rid of some. Well, we got rid of a bunch last year when the tree fell on our house. I don't care. <laughs> Read scripture, Marcus. <laughs> and the tax collectors. What should we do? Don't fraud people. Hmm. And the soldiers. What should we do? Don't mistreat people people. John's answer to all the people was stop and consider those around you. Now remember John appears on the scene in a period of time when God has not spoken for about 300 years. God has been silent. It's a desolate time. And the people are hoping and wanting a Messiah. So much so that some even ask if John the Baptist might be the Messiah. And John the Baptist let them know, no, I am not the one. There's one mightier than I who is coming. And the joy of his coming will triumph in the world. And the joy of the Messiah's coming will ultimately lead to the tragic death of John the Baptist. You know the outcome of John the Baptist. We read in our first reading from the book of Zephaniah, it was the same message, a message of optimism over pessimism, of joy over sadness. The book of Zephaniah was written during the reign of King Josiah. That was 640 to roughly 609 B.C. It was a period of time where the people were in exile and Assyrian gods were being worshipped even in Jerusalem. Pagan shrines were set up everywhere in the shadow of the temple. And although most of the book of Zephaniah is gloomy and sad, here he presents hope, joy, to reside in the remnant of Jews who remain faithful. 
the city and the people are to rejoice because the Lord is surely coming. It's going to take several hundred years, but the Lord is surely coming. Twice he states that despite the sad things are happening, God is in their midst. And joy is a constant theme in that passage we read in Zephaniah. It's a little bit unfortunate to me that sometimes joy in our understanding seems to be frivolous. We associate it with secular things like overindulgence, too much humor, maybe inappropriate humor sometimes. And so we associate joy as kind of a frivolous thing. And then we think of being gloomy or sad as being serious. But in God's understanding of the world, joy and joyfulness is the way we are to live in spite of whatever external circumstances we are faced. Zephaniah's opening words Shout for joy. The same words really that are used in the opening of Paul's letter that we read, not in the opening, in the closing of Paul's letter, but in the opening of the words that we read from Paul's letter. Rejoice! And even in reading from the book of Psalms, we read that often God laughs as he is enthroned in the heavens. And I oftentimes read Proverbs just because it has pithy little sayings, but even in the book of Proverbs, we're told that a joyful heart is the health of the body. But a sad spirit dries up the bones. Joy. I'm not talking about the joy we artificially manufacture by going and drinking that good, smooth drink that you enjoy by the fire during what right now is not a cold holiday season or that perfect gift that someone gives to you I'm talking about joy that comes in anticipating God's continuing work in us in the world in creation Joy that comes in knowing that God will come in final victory. Paul says in the book of Philippians that joy should always override our sorrow. Joy is a gift. Of God, a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's a mark of being a faithful Christian. After all, if we really believe the good news is the good news, even in the midst of our sadness, and I'm not saying there aren't moments when we should be sad, the death of people we love, the tragedies we see in the newspaper and news magazines, on the television, all those tragedies make us sad. 
but joy that comes from a gift of the Holy Spirit is a joy that in spite of all of that sees that ultimately God will reign and that God's Spirit invites us to be generous souls. God's Spirit invites us into a model of sharing and spreading the good news the good news that God has come into the world in Christ Jesus and that God will come again in final victory, as we say at our communion table. I don't know about you, but for me, when I remind myself that I can either get caught up in all the things going around me or I can instead receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of joy. I find that my present life is funner to live. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because then I can poke fun at myself. <laughs> I can poke fun of the places and spaces that still need to be redeemed by God. My sister and I um, talked this week, as we often do, and we were talking about somebody that we know who continues to live, who's quite old, who's a rather serious type. And my sister was reminding me, don't forget to make sure if y'all are sending a Christmas card this year. And last year, some of you know, we didn't get a Christmas card out, but we're trying this year. But anyway, my um, sister said, if you're going to get a Christmas card out, don't forget to keep her on your list. Otherwise, I'm going to have to hear her complain all year long that you were lazy or you have written her off your list. And my sister and I found ourselves laughing about some things. And I finally said, you know, I think she thinks it's a sin to be joyful. And my sister said, you know, I think you're right. Somebody has told her that to be joyful is a sin. And to live in grace is not possible in her world. It's all about whether you've done the right things, whether you're doing the right things, whether you're being the right thing, when really and truthfully it's about grace. God redeeming us in Christ and God allowing us to live as joyful individuals. I don't want to be known when I come close to the end of my life as a grumpy old man. Do you? Fred said maybe, well, I feel sorry for you, his grandson. And Paula, even you. I want to be known as a person who was filled with the joy of Christ. That same joy that Zephaniah had that Paul had and that John the Baptist had. A joy that was so intense that you couldn't keep it to yourself. A joy that waits to be shared. And if you have it, you recognize it and you share it. And it is our ode to joy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. amen. We continue together in worship as we come to that time where we um, share in a statement of faith, uh, number 881, you'll find in the back of your hymnals. This is the creed that most of you know by heart, so you can say, Psh, and stand up and say it without having the hymnal in front of you. But let us stand and affirm what we believe. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. offer our prayer concerns, believing that God hears our prayers and that God responds. Um, let me share several concerns that we have. We um, really have some things that deserve uh, our rejoicing and our celebration. We heard from Sherry uh, as she rejoiced and celebrated about um, her uh, procedure and how beneficial it has been. I talked last night to Ruth, who said to me, this is the best day I've had so far. So we continue to rejoice in her improvement, her recovery. Uh, many of us have been praying for Brooks Lied, and uh, we rejoice and celebrate uh, that Brooks is doing as well as he is doing in a private room. I suspect his, sis his wife, Carrie, Bill, your sister, might have to be taking him home this week and taking care of him. She might have to be doing some extra work for a few days. Hopefully, he may come home Monday. Monday, Monday. Praise God. Uh, so we celebrate those kinds of things that are answers to our prayers. We continue to hold Annie Cruzan and her husband in our prayers. Um, Susie, I'm sorry. I, here, I'm going to forget you, and we need to add that to celebration. So before we move to prayer concerns that we continue with... We need to rejoice because Susie is now three and a half years out, right? Right. And um, Amen. Amen. people Amen. told her, Thank no you. hope. And look at her. Susie, you look so healthy. You are a miracle. So can we all say a good, hearty, rejoice? Rejoice. There you go. Um, see, God does continue to work and give us reason to be joy even in the midst of sadness. Um, there are needs. Uh, Annie Cruzan continues to struggle with uh, her issue. We also pray for her husband. There are others of you who have unspoken requests that you've asked me to be in prayer about. We also remember the numerous individuals who have lost loved ones in recent weeks and months. I'm just going to name those that I'm aware of most recently. Fred um, and Paula losing Fred's mother, Margie. Um, Sue Hester in losing George. Um, Susan, your Susan's back there somewhere. There she is in losing your brother, um, Brian, not uh, too long ago. Tamsin Freeman in losing her brother. Uh, some of you losing a dear friend and losing Mary Cogan. Um, Barbara Klein losing her father not long ago. Those are the more recent ones, and that's quite a few, and we could go on beyond that to name others. Are there others that you would want to name in prayer this morning? Remind me, Frank, I'm drawing a, a dear friend. Okay, thank you. Jenny Eadlin, several months from the death of the guy. That's correct. 
a friend of yours from here. Um, yes. Other prayer concerns. Thank you, and I did have that on a list somewhere, and then I have two lists, and so, uh, but Doris Kendrick, who died recently, and I understand was buried here in recent weeks. Yes, Susie. Ed Tappy, surgical. Ed. Judy Bowenson, surgical. Any others? She okay. I I knew that things were better. That's new to me. So Barbara has re injured herself. Thank you. And that's a friend of Ruth that many of us know who's preached here many, many times and who's experiencing a lot of health issues. Bobby, it's good to see you back here with us this morning. Let us go to God in prayer, uh, and as always, the altar is open if you choose to join me in prayer. God of joy, we certainly are celebrating mild temperatures. In fact, some of us wonder if we haven't moved to Florida. And thank you, God, that we can laugh and worship. We recognize that these mild days are temporary and that because of where we live, we will experience colder days. But we are thankful for all the gifts you give us the gifts of the seasons that we so enjoy here. From the still, barren, quiet time of winter to the bursting of spring, the flowers and activity of summer, and the miraculous colors we see in the fall. We recognize we are privileged to live here and that in and of itself is a joy we celebrate. Far greater than that, O oh God, is the joy of the presence of Jesus Christ who offered himself for us And his joy is a joy that is compassionate, forgiving, long-suffering, and a joy that is always present in the midst of needs. We've celebrated many unbelievable answers, but we're also left with many who are dealing with grief and sadness with many who are facing surgeries and medical conditions. We ask that each name, and even those we name silently in our hearts, would experience your presence. And in the midst of their sadness, eternal joy would move in and be present. This we pray in the name of Christ who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in worship as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
Uh, I like that with that. 